Stories by H. P. Lovecraft The Nameless City When I drew nigh the nameless city, I knew it was a custard. I was travelling in a parched and terrible valley, under the moon and afar. I saw it protruding uncanny, above the sands as parts of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones, this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandmother of the eldest pyramid. A ruthless aura repelled me and bade me retreat with antique and sinister secrets, and no man should see, no one man else had dared to see. Remote in the desert of Albury lies the name of city, crumbling and inarticulate. Its low walls nearly hidden by the sands of uncounted ages. It must have been thus with all the first stones of Mephesus. was blade, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked, there is no legend so old to give it its name, or to recall if it's ever alive. It's told in whispers around campfires and muttered about by aggrandams and tents and treats. Cheeks, for all the tribes shun it, but wholly knowing why. It was of a place that Abel Azarad, the mad poet, dreamed on the night before he sang his unexplained couplet. That is not dead, which uh, can eternal lie, with the strange errors even death may die. I should have known that the hours of good reason are shunning a name a city. The city told of, a, of in a strange tale, been seen by no living man, yet defied them. I went to the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it, and it is why no other fear, face fears. Such hideous lines of fear as mine. Why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows, when I came upon the ghastly stillness of ending sleep that took me, looked at me, Chilly from the rays of the moon, gold moon, I missed the desert's heart. As I returned it, look, I forgot my triumph in finding it, and stood still, my camel, to wait for the dawn. For hours I waited, until the east grew grey and the stars faded. The grey turned to roselle light, edged with gold. I heard a moaning. I saw a storm of sand stirring by the antique stones. For the sky was clear and vast reaches of desert steel, and suddenly above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun. It seemed through the tiny sandstorm, which was passing away in my fevered, fevered state. I fancied from some remote depth there came a crash, a music of metal to hell, the fiery disc, a million hells, if in the banks of the, of the Nile. My ears rang when my imagination seemed. I led my camel slowly across the sand to a vocal stone place, a place too old for Egypt. I ran a road to remember a face which I alone, of living man, had seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundations of her places, houses and places, I wondered, finding ever a craving of this, not even a craving, carving on inscription to tell of these men. Men they were who built this city and dwelt within it so long ago. The antiquity of the spot was unwholesome. I longed to encounter some sign of the device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the ruins which I did not like. I had with me my many tools and dug much in the walls of the obliterated Ephesus. But progress was slow and nothing significant was revealed. The night and the moon returned, I felt a cold wind, which brought new fear, so that I did not dare to remain in the city. I went outside the antique walls to sleep. A small sighting stencil gathered behind me, blowing over the grey stones, where though the moon was bright and still, was bright and most of the most desert still. I awakened just as dawn from a pendant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from a metallic peal. I saw the sun peering readily through the last glass of a little stencil that hovered from the neighbour city and marked the quietness of the rest of the landscape. 
Once my adventure had been brooding villains a swell beneath the sand, an ogre over a cu- under a couplet, again dug a vainly for relics of the forgotten race. At noon I rested. The afternoon I spent much time tracing the walls, bygone streets, the outlines of nearby nearly vanished buildings. I saw this, that city might be mighty indeed and wondered at the sources of its greatness. To myself I pictured all the splendours an age had distant, a Colonel Randy uh, would not recall it. I thought of Shavrif, the, the doomed, that stood in the land of Menara, which mankind was young, where mankind was young, and of Ibeb, who was craven of grey stone before mankind existed. All well, once I came upon a place, the bedrock rose, dark, through the sand, and formed a low cliff, and here I saw with joy that seemed to promise further traces of an empty Dovalian people, hewed woolly on the face of the cliff, but the mistakable facades of several small, squat rock houses or temples, the interiors might preserve many secrets of ages too remote for calculation. Who stand in tombs that long since surfaces, their carvings, which may have been outside, very low and stands choked all the day, dark apertures near me. I cleared on with my spade and called for it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside, I saw the cavern. It was indeed a temple, and beheld strange signs, a race that lived, worshipped before the desert was a desert, primitive altars, pillars, and niches, all in curiously low, were not absent. Though I saw no sculptures, no frescoes, there are many singular stones, clearly shaped to symbols by artificial means. The loneliness of the chisel chamber was very strange. For I could hardly more, for I could hardly more than kneel upright. But the air was so great that my torch screwed only part of it at a time. I showed it oddly, it might in, so, in oddly, some of the far corners, the sudden order of stones suggested forgotten rites, terrible, revolting, despicable nature, made me wonder what manner of man could have made and frequented such a temple. When I had seen all that the place contained, I called out again a bit avid to find that temple, what the temples might yield. Night they approached, yet tangible things I see made curiosity stronger and fear I did not not flee from the long moon cast shadows that daunted me when I first saw the nameless city in the twilight I cleared another aperture and a new torch called into it finding some more vague stones and symbols and nothing more definite the older temple had to contain the room was just as low but much less broad ending in a very narrow passage Crowded with skewered and sil- sil- cryptical shrines. About these shrines I was prying with the noise of a wind and my camel broke as I broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over primeval ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand as seen blown a strong the descent increasing wind from some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew this was chilly, sandy wind which had disturbed the camel. I was about to lead him to a place of better shelter. I chanced to glance up and saw there was no wind at the top of the cliff. This astonished me and made me fearful again. I immediately recalled the sudden local winds I had seen and heard before at sunrise and sunset and judged it was a normal thing. I decided to come from the same rock footage leading to a cave. I watched the troubled sand trace it, saw some perceiving it came from the black orifice of the temple, long distance south of me, almost out of sight, almost against the choking sand, stor- sand cloud, I plodded towards this temple, which as I neared it larger than the rest, I shrewed a doorway far less clogged and the cake sand. I could have entered a not terrific force of icy wind 
Oh, mate, I'm almost cl- clutched my torch. It pulled mainly at the do- door, sighing and cuddling as it ruffled. The sand had spread among the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter, and the sand grew more and more still, till finally it was all at rest again, but a presence seen stalking along the spectral stones of the city, which I glanced at the moon. It seemed to quiver, though mirrored in the unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my first thoughts in wonder. As soon as the wind was quiet, gone, I crossed in the dark chamber from which it had come. The temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than ever. Even these, those I visited before, presumably natural caverns. So the bull winds from some region below. Here I could stand quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in other temples. On the walls of roof were held the first types of traces, critical art of the ancient race, curious curling streaks of paint, almost faded or crumbled away. The two on the altars I saw with rising excitement, a maid of well fashioned in the carvings. I held my torch aloft. It seemed to me the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural. I wondered what prehistoric cutters of stone had worked, had worked for, first worked upon. Their engineering skill must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of fantastic flame showed me that of which I had been seeking, the opening of those remote uh, abysses whence the sudden wind had blown. I grew faint. I saw that it was a small plainly artificial door, chiselled in a sort of rock. I crouched my torch within, beholding a black tunnel with a roof arching low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. To always see those steps in my dreams, I came to learn what they meant. At the time, I hardly knew whether to call them steps or mere footholds in pre- precipitous descent. My mind was whirling with mad faults. The words of burning of Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert for the, land, for the lands that man knew to the, known to the nameless city, and men dare not know. Yet I hesitated, only for a moment for advancing through the door and commencing to climb cruelly down a steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. It is only in a terrible phantasium a drugs of delirium. Any other man can have such a descent as mine. Our precious led infinitely down like some haunted, hideous haunted well. The torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths toward which I was crawling. Lost track of the hours and forgot to consult my watch. I was frightened when I thought of the distance I must be transversing. It would change the direction of the vault's deepness. And once I came to a long, low, low level passage, where I had to wiggle feet first along the rocky floor, hold my torch at length, arm's length, beyond my head. The place was not high, no for kneeling. After that, the more the steep steps, I was still scrambling down immediately. When my falling torch died out, found the torch died out, I could not. I did not think I noticed it at the time. But I did not notice it. He was still holding it high above me, as if it were blaze. A quite unbalanced with instinct for strange and the unknown, which made me wander on the earth in a halter of far ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness, they had flashed with all my mind fragments, my terrorist treasury of demonic lore, senses of a Mazaya, a mad Arab, paragraphs from an Af- Apocalyptical nightmares of Demogorgos, the infamous lines and delirious image of the Monde of Gracia de Mins. I peeped queer of extracts, a muttered of aphorism, and demons that floated with him down the onyx, later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dudley's tales, the reintegrated blackness of the abyss. Once when the when the abyss when it once when the descent grew descent grew amazingly steep, 
recited something in song, sing song of Thomas Moore, till I feared to recite more. As we ever are, a darkness black, as witches' cauldrons are when filled, where moon drugs in eclipse distilled, leaning to look his foot my pass. Down through that chasm I saw beneath, as far as a vision could explore, a jetty size as smooth as glass, looking as this vanished over, with a dark pitch with the seat of death, throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist, my feet again put a level for the level floor. I found some of the place slightly higher than rooms and two smaller temples, such so incredibly far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could not, could, but could kneel upright. In the dark, I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I stood, I soon knew I was in this narrow passage, where walls are lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. In that prosaic and abysmal place, I felt for such things of polished wood and glass, I shuddered at possible implications. A vase cases were apparently ranged from along each side, passage at regular intervals, they were oblong and horizontal, hideously, like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three of verbal examination, I found they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passages were a long one, so I flung loudered ahead roughly in a creeping run. It could would have seemed horrible. And her eye watched me in the blackness, crossing from side to side, occasionally to feel the surroundings and be sure the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is used to thinking, rigidly, but I almost forgot the darkness and pitched the endless corridor of wood and glass, though steady monotony, as though I saw it. And then, in a moment of describable motion, I did see it. Just when my fancy merged to real sight, I could not tell. There came a gradual glow ahead. All at once I knew I saw the dim outlines of a corridor and cases, revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphate. <coughs> For a little while, it all was exactly as I imagined. It, since the glow was very faint, by what is my cunning kept on stumbling ahead to stronger light, I realised that my fancy had been but feeble. This hall was no relic of crudely light. Quality like that of temples in the city above, but a moment of most magnificent exotic arch, rich, vivid, and daring, fantastic designs and pictures formed a continuous scheme of memorial paintings and lines and colours were beyond description. Cases were stone, strange, golden wood, with fonts and elaborate, exquisite glass, containing the mummified forms of creatures outright, reaching the grotesque, most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any ideas of these monstrosities is possible. They were the reptile kind, but with body size, just in something a crocodile, sometimes a seal, but more than nothing of which even an actress of the paleontologist ever heard. Size approximate a small man, their four legs born, delicate and eventually flexible feet, curiously like men with hands and fingers. The strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour, violating all known biological principles. To nothing can such things be well compared. In one flash I thought the comparisons ferried with the cat, the bullfrog, the mystic, the satire, and a human being, not drove himself, had had so colossal and protuberate a forehead. Yet the thorns are noiseless, noiseless, noiseless and the alligator like jaw. Place a thing outside all the established characters. At the rate of the time and the reality of the mummies, half expecting the artificial idols. As soon as decided, they indeed some Pergullian species that which lived with the name of city was alive, crowning the, the, their most grotesqueness. Most of them were grotesquely enrobed in the costumes of fabric, lavishly laden with ornaments of gold, jewels, Unknown shining metals, metals. The importance of these creolian creatures must have been vast, 
they had fell first placed among the wild designs for soon walls and ceilings in match their skills and artists drawn them the world of their own within which within they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit the dimensions i cannot help but think they pictured history was critical perhaps during the progress of the race and worshipped them these creatures i said to myself were to the men of the name were to the men of the name of city that as she was was to roam of some total beast is a tribe of indians holding this view i could trace roughly a wonderful epic of nameless city the tale of mighty sea coast metropolis that ruled the world before africa rose out of ways it struggles as the sea shrank away the desert crept into fertile valley that held it i saw its wars and triumphs its troubles and defeats afterwards its terrible fight against the desert with thousands of its people they were exempted the energy by the grotesque reptiles were driven to chisel the way down through the rocks in some marvellous manner to another well within the, their prophets had told them they were all vividly weird and realistic this greed connection with awesome descent the maid was unmistakable i even recognised the passages as i crept along the corridor towards the point of light i saw the latter stages of the painted epic the leaving taking of the race I dwelt in the name of city, a valley around for ten million years, raised whose souls shrank from quitting scenes, their bodies, and oh so long when it had settled as nomads in the earth's youth, hemming in a virgin rock for primal shrines which they had never ceased to worship. Now that the light was better, I studied the pictures more closely, remembering that, that the strange rituals must represent, must represent the unknown man, Men pondered upon the customs of the inner city. Many things were peculiar and inexplicable. Current civilization, including the written alphabet, was seemingly to risen to a higher order than those immeasurable later civilizations of Egypt and Kala said. Yet were curious, but there were curious ambitions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths of feudal customs. Save such as those related wars, violence, and plague. I wondered the resonance, shrewd concerning natural death, as only an idea of earthly mortality, a foster of cheering illusion. Still nearer the end of the passage was faint scenes of the most picturesque and unbrilliant, contrasted views of the name of city, fear and desertion, and growing ruin, the strange new realm of paradise which the race had its way for the stone. In these views of the city, the desert valley is strewn always by moonlight, a golden numerous hovering over the fallen walls, hovering in splendid perfection, former times, drew spiritually and exclusively by the artists. Fragile scenes were almost too extravagant to believe, portrayed and hidden, world of eternal day, filled with glorious cities and infernal hills and valleys, at the very last, I thought I saw the science, artistic anticlimax. Painters were less skilful, much more bizarre than even the wildest of earlier scenes. It seemed to record a slow decadence of ancient stock, covered with a growing ferocity towards the outside world, which was driven by the desert. The forms of people, represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually vast, wasting away, for their spirit assumed, hovering among ruins by moonlight gained in proportion, a masquerated priest, displayed in as reptiles, in all that rose, cursed the upper air, and all who breathed it, one terrible fine scene, shrewd, primitive looking man, perhaps a pioneer of ancient Terem, the city pillars, torn to pieces by members of the elder race. I remember how the arrows feared the native city, and glad that beyond this place grey walls and sea were bare. And the view was a pageant of mutual history I approached very closely to the end, low seated hall, and aware of the great gate through which this came all the illuminating for fate. Creeping up to it, I cried aloud in translucent amazement in what lay beyond, for instead of another brighter chamber, there was only an immutable void of a uniform radiance, one, such one might fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest upon a sea of up sunlight mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped I could not stand upright in it. 
Before me was an infinity of subterranean effigies. Reaching down from the passage of the abyss was a head of a steep flight of steps, small and numerous steps, like those of black passages I had traversed. But after a few feet, the glowing vapours concealed everything. Swung back upon the left hand, the wall of the passage, a massive door of brass, gradually thick and decorated, fantastic brass reliefs, which had closed, shut over the whole inner world of light away from the vaults and patches of rock. I looked at the steps of the novice, dared not tr- try them. I touched the open brass door and did not move it. Then I sank prone to the door and floor. I mined a flame of prodigious reflections, which even a death like exhaustion could banish. I lay still those closed eyes, free to ponder many things I had lightly noted in the threshold, came back to me with a new and terrible significance. Scenes represented the name of city, its heyday, the vegetation of the valley round it, the lands in which its merchants traded, the energy of the crawling creatures puzzled me to my universal prominence. I wondered what it should be so closely followed, pictured history, such importance by the first souls of the name of city, strewn in proportions fitted to the reptiles, and wondered as what real proportions and significance had been a reflect in the moment of such oddities. I played the notice in the ruins. I thought curiously of the loneliness of primal temples and the underground corridor, which was doubtless strewn out thus at the fence to the reptile deity, deities here honoured, they are honoured. Though it perforce re- reduced the virtue to calling, perhaps the very rights reduced calling is limited limitation of creatures. No religious the furry theory have I could easily explain why the level passages are in awesome descent should be should be as low as the temples or lower since one could not kneel in it. As I thought of the crawling creatures with hideous modified forms were so close to me. I felt a new throb of fear, mental associations were curious, I shrank from the idea it set the poor primitive man torn to pieces. The last paintings mine was the only moonlit form of mist and many relics and symbols of primordial life. But always my strange and roving existence, one that soon drove out to me from the numerous animals that might contain present a problem worthy of the great explorer. While a weird world of mystery lay far down the flight, the coolest small steps, I could not no doubt, I hoped to find there these human memorials, where the fainted corridor Failed to give. The Sioux had pictured unbelievable cities, and valleys, and lower realms. Yes, I realm. I fancy to them rich and colossal ruins that awaited me. My fears indeed concerned the past rather than the future. Not even a physical horror of my position in that cramped corridor of dead reptiles and the Caribbean Sioux. Miles below the world, I knew I faced another world, very like the mist. Should, could match the dreadful dread. I felt the abysmal activity of the scene with song. Ancient is so vast and vanished measurements feeble, seemed to yet leer down for the primal stones and rocks through temples of the name of city, with the very latest standing mats and fresuits, shrewd oceans of continents and man have forgotten. I only hear in some vaguely familiar outlines of what has happened in geological ages. Since the painting ceased, the death of the fleeting race resentfully succumbed to gay. A man might say, life once teemed in these caverns, a luminous realm beyond now. I was alone with vivid relics. I trembled to think the countless ages for which these relics had kept silent, deserted vigil. Suddenly there came upon another burst acute fear, which is immediately seized me. Ever since I first saw the terrible valley, the name of city under a common moon, and despite my exhaustion, I felt myself starting frequently to a sitting position. I was gazing back along the black corridor towards the tunnel and rose to the outer world. My sensations were such, like those which had made me shun the name of city at night, were as inexplicable as they had were upon the potent. In another moment, However, I received a still greater shock in the form of 
heaven at this sound. First, a broken utter silence, a tomb like depths, with deep, low moaning of a distant throng of condemned spirits. I came with this direction, which I startling, which I startling. It is volume rapidly grew, to it soon vibrated rightfully through the low prejudice. And some time I came conscious, increasing draught of cold air, lightways flowing from the tunnels of the city above. A touch of this air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gust which had risen from the mouth of the abyss. Each sunset of sunrise, the rich and redeemed revealed the hidden tunnels to me. I looked on my watch and saw that sunrise was near, so I bracing myself to resist the gale, was sweeping down to the cabin home as it swept forth that evening. I fear again wanted low, since a natural phenomenon tends to dispel broadings over the unknown. More and more round rarely pulled and shrieking, moaning like the wind to gulf in the earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor. I fear I might be spoldy, swept boldly through the open gate for recent abyss. But fairy I did not expect. I grew aware of the actual slipping my form towards the abyss. I was set by a thousand new terrors of apparition apparition presitudes. Miles away in the world I knew a face another world, a very light of mist, could match the lethal dread. I felt the abysmal antiquity of the scene and its soul. And this, so vast a measurement feeble seemed to leer down the primal stones of rock hewed temples, and the name of city or the very latest of the standing maps of Frisudes, shrewd oceans of continents that man had forgotten. There were only here and some vaguely familiar outline which could or what could have happened in age logical ages. Since the painting ceased and dying hating race were evidently succumbed to decay, no man might say life has seemed t- t- once deemed these caverns in numerous realm beyond now. I was alone in vivid relics. I had trembled to think of the countless ages of which these relics had kept a silent deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of acute fear which had intermittently seized me ever since I first saw the terrible valley. A name of city under cold moon, sight of exhaustion. I found myself staring frankly instead of position, gazing back along the black corridor towards the tunnel that rose to the outer world. The station as much like those which men made me shun the name of city at night. This vehicle was impotent. Another moment, however, I received a great, a still greater shock, form a definite sound, first of which had broken the utter silence of doom like death. It was low, it deep, low moaning of distant throng of condemned spirits. Came a direction which was startling, and early and rapidly grew, till it were averted right through for a low passage. At the same time, came conscious of increasing draught of cold air, like waves flowing from the tunnels from the city above. Touching this air seemed to restore my balance, but I instantly recalled a sudden gust which had risen above the mouth of the abyss, each sunset of sunrise, one which had revealed indeed the hidden tunnel to me. I looked at my watch and saw the sun was near. I braced myself to resist the gale and sweeping down in its cabin home, swept down forth for the evening. I fear again waned low, since the most natural phenomenon tends to spell broodings is un- over the unknown. More and more madly poured that shrieking, moaning like the wind into the gulf of the earth. I dropped prone again and clutching vainly at the floor, the fear being spoldy. Swept boldly through the open gate of the abyss, present abyss, such fury as I not expected. I grew very aware of the actual slippings of my form to the abyss of a set of a thousand new terrors. My apprehension, imagination, megalomaniac of vast of awakened, incredible fancies. Once more, I compared myself suddenly to the only human image in a frightful corridor, a man torn to pieces by a nameless race, the fiendish crawling, crawling. Of swirling currents, which seemed to abide a victory, victory rage, or stronger because it was more largely impotent. I think I screamed frankly, near the, the laugh. I was almost mad. But I did not did so for my cries were lost in the pale born babel of vowing 
whined Grace. I tried to crawl against the murderous invisible torrent. I could not even hold my own as I pushed slowly in slowly towards the unknown world. Feeling funny reason, my sister for holy snap, I have felt bubbling over and over the explicable carpet, a mad Arab Azabel, who dreamed the name of the nameless city that is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons in death might die. And the grim bowling desert guards know what really took place, what indescribable a struggles and shambles, the dark of Jordan and Abion guided me back to life. Which I must always remember a shiver like wind to oblivion. Obers claims me. My interest in natural colossal was a thing, far beyond all the ideas of man. So we believe the sept in the silent dome of all as well as the woman when one can not sleep. It is have said the fury that's rushing blast was infernal. Kaolo demonically his voices were hideous. We pent up confession as a dissolute entities. Presently, these voices are still chaotic before me, seeming to my breaching brain to take a articulate form behind me, and down in, in the grave are numbers of our in dead antiquities. Leagues below the dawn light lit world of man, I saw a ghastly cursing and snarling of strange tongue fiends. Turning, I saw outline on Loomis Aethera, a- a- abyss. Could have been seen against the dark of the corridor. A nightmare hold of rushing nibbles, hate distorted, grotesquely pallid, half transparent devils of a race of no man might mistake the calling reptiles of Nema City. As the wind died, I was plunged into the goal, pulled darkness of earth to build. Behind the last of the creatures, great blazing door clanged shut, with a deafening peal of metallic music. The reverberation swelled out. Of the debt to the desert world, the hell of the rising sun, a million and holds it from the banks of the Nile. You've been listening to the story by H.P. Lovecraft, The Nameless City, written in January 1921, per published in the Wolverine League, number 11, November. 1921, pages 3 to 15.